Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of your Storybox podcast, the 3am edition for me and the 12pm edition, I believe, for my guest today, Matthew West. That wasn't to make him feel bad at all. It was to make everyone know that if I fall asleep mid-interview, no, it's not going to happen. I'm just kidding. But everyone, welcome back to the Story Box. My guest today is the incredible Matthew West, who is a five-time Grammy nominee and multiple ASCAP Christian Music Songwriter Artist of the Year winner and a 2018 Dove Award Songwriter of the Year. He's done many, many incredible things. He's an author. He's a podcaster as well. He has a brilliant new book coming out, which I highly recommend everyone gets a copy of. I love the title, The God Who Stays. Life Looks Different With Him By Your Side. And if you haven't seen the cover too, it's pretty cool as well. Like you, you got it. I'm a cover guy. And oh, thanks. Cover looks epic. So well done on the cover, man. But Matthew West, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Well, you can, and I am. I feel welcome, and I'm I'm honored to be able to talk to you today. And I feel lazy the fact that you just said it's 12 noon here, <laughs> so that's awesome. But I'm great. I'm just so grateful for the chance to talk to you, and and thanks for the compliment on the book cover. I'm actually looking at at it as I speak to you, and uh, you know, I the only credit I can take for the art direction is they sent it to me and i said that looks awesome that was my contribution <laughs> we'll go with that <laughs> that was that i i try to you know one of the things that i want to do in my life is like i i want to surround myself with experts and then i but it does no good to surround yourself with experts if you don't let experts do what they do right so mm. uh so i think sometimes the key to uh you know doing something special is when you've got those people saying, here's what we think is great. I'm like, you know what? I want to trust that. And then I want you to trust me when I lean in with my expertise. So I'm going to focus on what's inside the cover of the book. And uh, you tell me what looks great on the outside. So knowing my place, I guess, is is uh, one of the keys. <laughs> but for those people that uh, aren't watching the video, would you be able to describe what the cover looks like to them in, in the best way you can? Please? Yeah, so it, it it's very... Um, I would say it's very informal, right? They chose this like hand sketched uh, font, right? So it's yeah. not a font you're going to find when you open up Microsoft Word. It's not papyrus or whatever, uh, or New <laughs> Times, Times New Roman. Roman. <laughs> yeah, Times New Roman. So they they the graphic designer like scratched it out on their own, and uh, so it almost looks handwritten. And then um, the background is this kind of starry night. And then you see a picture of just one person sitting by a campfire, like almost like on a mountain or or somewhere in a field and sort of to create that image of of isolation. But the reminder that even if you feel isolated, you are not alone, which is really mm -hmm. the, the heartbeat of the book. And of course, our world's been through an extreme season of forced isolation for many parts of the world and forced separation from family, loved ones, co-workers, school, um, forced distance from each other, even standing in line. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, everything has looked different. Um, and yet this book is an exploration how life itself looks different when you realize that everything you walk through, you are not walking through it alone. Yeah. And uh, and so, so yeah, so I love the cover and uh, I hope the reader loves what's inside the cover as much as the cover itself. I'm sure they will, man. And I, I want to get to the book in just a moment, but I wanted to ask you my very first question, which is officially, what does success look like for you? Man, uh, you know, that's a great question. Can I tell you the answer of what I thought it looked like uh, 15 years ago and what I think it looks like now mm -hmm. um, are, are vastly different. Um, you know, I, I don't think I was ever one that was chasing celebrity. I was also always chasing purpose. Yeah. Really, I really feel that way. But at the same time, you can fall in love with um, applause. You can begin to build um, your own uh, your own metrics and kind of start to have the music industry or the professional world decide, help you decide what the definition of success is. And so... I mean, I would say, gosh, it's hard for me to deny that the definition of success at times has been, well, if your song reaches number one, mm -hmm. then 
then that's a success. If it only gets to number two, we're sorry to inform you, but that is not success. And gosh, that is such a dysfunctional way of thinking. And yet so many recording artists and musicians and songwriters, uh, and then you, you fill in the blank, whatever profession you're in, you know, it's just like, if you're not, what did, uh, (laughs) I never thought I would quote Ricky Bobby, but there was a Will Ferrell movie, you know, <laughs> where he played a NASCAR driver. And his whole thing was, if you ain't first, you're last. Tell and you, Nights. Love it. Yeah, tell you, Dale Nights. That's what it was. <laughs> but, you know, there's that that mentality that you can adopt. I'll tell you, at the very beginning of my career, my very first song that went to radio became the most played song of that year. It was a nine week number one song. So it was number one for over two months in a 12 month period. And can I just tell you that that didn't make the pressure go away. That heaped more pressure onto me. And guess what happened when my second song went out and it went to like number five and died. I thought the world was ending. I mean, I was like, that's it. That's it. I'm I'm a one hit wonder. It's over. And so I, I can tell you honestly today, as I'm talking to you, that all these years have really brought me a renewed perspective on what the true definition of success is. And I kind of think of it in the terms of the words greatest hits, because Mm. I'll never forget my label called me and they said, would you believe you have enough hits to actually make a greatest hits album? And I thought that that would be like the ultimate definition of success. And I didn't feel any more fulfilled after that phone call than I did before I got that phone call. And so I've been thinking about my greatest hits differently. I actually wrote about it in the book about, hey, I wonder when I get to heaven, if Mm -hmm. God's idea of what my greatest hits in life were, are going to be way different than what I thought mine were. And uh, these days, when I think about my true greatest hits, I think about my wife, Emily, and my two daughters, Lulu and Delaney, and hopefully the impact that my life will have on the world beyond just a song on the radio. I love that, man. And when you brought up the Talladega Nights section, the one line that I kept thinking about was, I'm all checked out Mountain Dew. <laughs> it gets me oh, every no, time. Oh, you like a spider monkey. <laughs> <laughs> that, that shake and bake. I mean, gosh. <laughs> uh, uh, such my, a classic. <laughs> my wife is like, how can you memorize so many movie lines? Like just, and I, it's like, all the funny movies from when I was young, like anything that had Chris Farley in it back yeah. in the day, like rest in peace. But anyways, yeah. So all, all the classics, you know, I, I do the same thing and it, and it annoys my girlfriend sometimes because like I, are, I speak in movie lines and she has to. What's, what's the yeah. movie that you can quote all the lines of? Uh, probably The Princess Bride. Or oh, man. Marriage. Yeah. Marriage is what brings us <laughs> together today. today. <laughs> Get to the what's end. The other, what's the? My name is. Uh, what, what's he say? Uh, you kill my brother. Prepare oh, to die. My name is Ingham Montoya. You kill my, you brother. my brother. Prepare to die. Stop saying that. <laughs> my name. I almost. <laughs> did you say Shrek too? Yeah, Shrek. Uh, the first one. Um, oh man, when, classic. I know. Tell me about it. We had to sit. Uh, in school and watch the whole movie. And then there was one section where they play the song Hallelujah. And we had to dissect every single scene in that, that one little song. And my goodness, it just, it's stuck in my brain now. Like I'd say repetition is the key to a successful life, right? Like my goodness. (laughs) That is awesome. Whenever they play the, the movie now, I'm just, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm trying to have to stop myself from actually saying all the lines because I know. Every line. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So. The um, other day I said, uh, somebody said something to me that was, it wasn't like, you know, it was like a a dig at me, you know, they were kind of giving me a hard time. And I, I accident, I just said, you cut me real deep just now, Shrek. And, uh, and they were like, what? I was like, oh, nothing. You know, <laughs> isn't it, isn't it interesting when people like it, it goes completely over someone's head, they don't understand what you're talking about. And then you just feel like you're all alone. It's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> what's going on here? Like, don't you watch movies? And and then like, oh, we watch movies, but we just don't memorize them like you do. We're not, we're not a fanatic yeah. like you. And I'm like, yeah, I feel, I feel bad for my girlfriend. Cause I'm, I'm constantly like talking in movie references. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
She's trying to keep up with me, man. But um, anyway, I I'll, digress. I'll keep, up with, I'll keep up with you. Don't worry about it. Good. I'm glad to have a brother like that so we can bounce off movie movie lines. Uh, and if we do any more movie lines during this conversation, please just add them <laughs> in. Like, <laughs> be so good. Um, but I wanted to bring up something else that you mentioned there, which is qualifying the world's version of success versus God's version of success. What have you noticed is the difference there or purpose that is? Yeah. So I, I mean, the first thing that popped into my head is self versus others. Right. So, you know, I think a lot of times the world's definition of success, we, I mean, we, we marvel and we applaud at people who have achieved personal success, you know, whether it's a monetary goal, a professional goal, um, the Instagram photos of them in the private jets, the, you know, whatever that may be fame. Um, and, and yet I, I think what I kept coming back to, and even when I was writing the book, I wound up writing a lot about Matthew 25 and, um, you know, in, in Matthew 25, Jesus lays out what our greatest hits will be in terms of, and it's all about what we did for others, yeah. right? I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And then, and this is, and then you'll ask, when did I see you naked and, and clothe you? When did I, right? And he says, well, whatever you did for the least of these, of course, I'm paraphrasing, whatever you did for the least of these, you've done for me. And so, I, I have to think about this. And even as I say these words, I'm, I'm challenged myself by like, okay, today, when I get to the end of the day and I put my head down on my pillow, where will the scales be tipped? How much did I do to, to push my rock to the top of the mountain versus mm -hmm. how much I did to help somebody else achieve their goals and dreams? How much did I do to champion others? How much did I do to lift up the least of these? Uh, how much did I do to focus on, you know, being a better friend to my wife uh, who wishes I was going to lunch with her right now, instead of having this interview, you know, how, how did I support Sorry. my daughter? You know, that kind of thing. What kind of a husband am I? What kind of a, a father am I? What kind of a son am I? What kind of a legacy am I leaving in mm -hmm. terms of service to other people? And, you know, when, it, with a profession like mine, sometimes it can be so self-focused. And uh, and so I'm challenged even as I'm telling you that. But I think that that's got to be one of the key differences between the world's definition of success and, and God's definition. When you speak about your greatest hits just a moment ago, saying that your greatest hits would basically be your wife and your two daughters, what does it mean to you to be a great husband and a great father? Um, well, I'm far from perfect at both. And I am the first to admit it. I've always wanted to be the person who never claimed to be a perfect parent or father or I mean, father or husband, but was always on a race to get to the if, you know, if forgiveness is a finish line, I want to get there first. You know, I want to, you know, when dad messes up, I want to not be too proud, you know, and some of the special moments that I've had with my daughters haven't been in the face of victory, but in the face of me, like overreacting about something or, or putting too much pressure on them. And, but then humbly knocking on a bedroom door and saying to my daughter, Hey, Lulu, can I talk to you? You know, Hey, I just want to apologize. I feel like I feel like I put too much pressure on you about your homework. And, you know, I'm I'm just I want the best for you. And sometimes dad doesn't always handle situations right. And like I'm gonna tell you, like when when you race to that finish line of I'm sorry, you know, in your relationship with your wife or your kids or your whatever that may be, man, it just clears so much distance away. And you can find a really close connection as a result of having you know, grace for others and asking them to have grace for you. Um, beyond that, like, I think the way you spend your time and the way you spend your money, they tell the greatest story about what you think is most valuable, right? Mm -hmm. You spend your time and money on the things that matter the most to you. And, um, you know, so if I'm spending my time 
uh, doing everything but spending time with my wife and I'm I'm investing everywhere else except for investing in relationships with those closest to me, then then I've got a problem. And, uh, you know, I've had that problem before, too, you know, and I don't. And so I, I write a lot of songs about that, too. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I You'll see that theme pop up in my songs. And that means that I'm I'm mulling that over in my own life. I'm taking inventory. And sometimes I don't like what I'm seeing. Sometimes I don't like that my priorities are a little skewed. And it all it takes is a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. And you're completely off track running for the wrong finish line. One of my favorite stories was um, I was going for a run in um, Portland, Maine. I had a show that night, beautiful city. And I just saw a beautiful day. I'm going to go for a run. I found this neighborhood street and it was completely empty. And so instead of running on the sidewalk, the sun was out. I was just like, I'm going to run right down the middle of the road. (laughs) So I just jog it. I'm feeling good. And this, this old man kind of appears out of nowhere and he's walking in my direction as I'm running down the middle and he's got this like white tank top that's got holes in it and stains and a chain and just kind of disheveled. And as I, as I ran closer to him, he stopped me and he said, Hey, Hey son, would you, would you be mad if I told you something? And I was like, what? And then he pointed to the direction I had just run from. And he goes, the finish line is that way. You're going the wrong way. And then he just laughed and walked off. And it was like this crazy old man who like, I don't, it was the strangest thing, but he thought that was so funny. But I thought about that afterwards. Like he was pointing and he was like, you're going the wrong way. As if I was, you know, blind to the race that I was running. And I thought, man, if that's not a lesson for life, I don't know what is. So thanks to that crazy old man for, for uh, stopping me in the street, because I've thought about that so many different times. Like I don't want to get to the end of my race and go, Oh, the finish line was that way. (laughs) How do you know you're going in the right direction though? Constant inventory. I mean, isn't it, isn't it like checking your pulse and, and checking in with, you know, who's, who's guiding your story. You know what I mean? I think, I think that's where, I mean, gosh, it, not to oversimplify it, but doesn't it all come back to like, who do I believe is charting the path for me? Yeah. Is it me? Am I, am I believing what the world says? And that it's like, if I can dream it, I can do it. And that I'm the, the master of my own domain and the, and the creator of my own destiny. Is it, is, I mean, all of those things sound so good, right? You can do it. If you can dream it, you can do it. The world is your oyster, whatever the thing is, right? That those sayings tickle our ears because they fool us into believing that we are the ultimate authority on our life, that we are the ultimate uh, decider of our fate. And, uh, and so I think ultimately, how do I know? Well, I have to come to that acknowledgement that I don't know. Yeah. And I, and I, for me, I have chosen to surrender my story to who I believe is the rightful author of my story. Yeah. And, and to know that one, he promises my God who made me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creation. I'm not a creator. Now I create songs, but who created me? Mm. Where did I come from? And so every creation has a creator and I believe I'm not the creator of me. And when you fall under that understanding, that's step one. And then going, okay, I believe my creator knows why I was created. And I want to follow his plan for his creation, which is me. I want to, I want to know what he says I'm here for. Yeah. And, and ultimately, that is my compass is, okay, I believe that you made me. God, I'm a, I'm a creation of God. I'm the word I'm his craftsmanship the Bible says and I was created to do good works which he prepared in advance for me to do. Yeah. And that that means I got a mission. I've got a purpose. But then he also says that he will be with me every step of the way, that he will never leave me and never forsake me. So the creator accompanies his creation mm-hmm. on his mission and marks the path and the road rises up to meet me with every step that I take. I look at it. That was beautiful, man. I look at it as creativity is a, as a gift from God and we are called to create for God. 
hundred percent. And we, we, we can try and do it alone. And most of us do do it alone. And then we finally realize that, or God can say to us, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you get what you want just so you can realize that it's not fulfilling yeah, as it would have been if I was actually leading you there and you were following me. Like it's amazing how many times in my own life where I've chased something and I've said, no, no, God, I've got this. It's all, it's all mine. Leave me alone. And then I just stumble and fall, hurt myself. And yet God is still gracious and saying, look, you know what? I created a beautiful thing in failure. You get down on your hands and knees and you humbly face me and you apologize and you say, you are nothing without me. <laughs> and that's what I've realized in this journey of life. And I'm, I'm still, I'm still relatively young. Like I turned 26 on Monday, but, and I, you know, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm there cause I'm definitely not, but it's just an amazing thing. How we as human beings, finite human beings want to challenge the creator. <laughs> it's just, it well, I mean, my mind. Or not only challenge a creator, but to deny that, that there is one. I mean, yeah. uh, we're living, we're living in an insane time right now where we have, we are obsessed with being our own creator. We're like, literally like we're, we're seeking to change who we were created to be and then decide that we have the power and authority to do that. Yeah. And I mean, our, and that's where our world is obsessed with identity and there's so much confusion right now. And it's because we're looking everywhere except, I mean, it's like, we're looking within, I, you know, I, I think about it sometimes. Like if I get an Apple computer and let's say Steve jobs was still living or uh, it was a Tim Cook now who who runs Apple. If I got an Apple computer and I'm trying to figure out how to work this thing and I was offered a free session with Tim Cook or Steve Jobs to teach me everything I ever wanted to know about Apple, but I said, "No thanks. I'm going to I'm just going to I'm just going to figure it out on my own." Like who would do that? <laughs> if you had the chance to learn how to work your Apple computer from the creator of that Apple computer. Well, I mean, if you know what I mean, it's like to if you got the chance to go inside the mind of Elon Musk to better understand electric vehicles or whatever, like you think of the analogy, but it's absolute insanity that we would step that we would deny and say, you know what, I I don't want to consult with the creator of me. I'm going to deny that I was created. I'm just here. And I'm here to do whatever with my life and my body and my identity, everything I want. I'm change it all. I'm gonna do it all. I'm the ultimate authority over my life. And um, you know, so I, I think in my life where I have found purpose and fulfillment is in laying down the right that I think culture says I have, mm -hmm. and and saying, you know what, I I think my life's a story, but gosh, when I put the pen in my own hands, like it never leads me to the fulfillment that I thought it would. And so I think, I think I want to put the pen back in his hands and it's not even up to me to do like he is in control. Mm -hmm. He made me and he has a plan for me. And when I go away from that plan, my life is never as good as it could have been. Even if it's a good life in the eyes of the world, it's I'm still missing out on amazing. I'm still missing out on a blessing. And so like you talked about, like, Sometimes we get what we think we want and it's not what we needed. Sometimes we don't get what we thought we needed because God knew what we wanted. Yeah. And ultimately it's still all roads will lead back to that reminder and maybe that humble wake up call for, for us to go, Oh, okay. I'm not the author of my story. There's, there's one who made me and he knows what's best for me. Yeah. Yeah. Your book title is The God Who Stays, Life Looks Different With Him By Your Side. And the subtitle, well, the actual title itself is, is brilliant. The subtitle, though, it caught my attention, and especially with what we're talking about now, I wanted to ask you sort of a philosophical question, if I can, uh, and maybe we can work through this together. But when we're talking about how people deny that Christ doesn't exist. For those people that 
do deny him, how would we help them to understand that he is real, he does exist, and, and life is better with him in your life? Well, I think the best way to do that is to shout loudly, to thump uh, your fist <laughs> on the Bible, um, to hold a picket sign. That usually works, maybe outside of where people work. Uh, <laughs> really be vocal and angry and defiant in your... <laughs> I'm sorry. Bible bash us. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what I find works the most. No, um, I mean, clearly I'm being sarcastic. Um, you know, our actions are always, I mean, look, why do things, why do statements become cliches? Because a lot of times they're, you know, there's truth to them, right? And, you know, obviously we know that um, our actions will speak louder and, and and I just believe that a life lived in humility and in humble submission to the rightful author of your story, it will itself tell a story of a God who is real, of a God who loves his children and his creation, and of a God who promises that you never have to walk through your life without his help. Right. That when he says that you can do all things, right? When you read the scriptures, like I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I have learned the secret of being content. One of the things I love about that verse in Philippians chapter uh four, a lot of times Chris, there's Christian anthem scriptures, right? And let me pull yeah. this up real quick as I'm talking to you. But Philippians 4:13, right? Um, we know that verse. If you've gone to church any amount of time, that was one of the first Bible verses my dad taught me but i have to tell you let me pull up this other scripture um oh where it is where is it where is it, where is it? Um, i got the wrong translation but uh paul writes um i've learned the secret of being content do you know this verse i do yeah and i love um read the full chapter here i just want to make sure i don't paraphrase it but i love this like i rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Uh, here it is. I know what it is to be in need, I, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And I mean, to me, that's like um, a life lived knowing um, th that's the ultimate self-empowerment. It's the self-empowerment that our world is craving, isn't it? I could do all things. The world likes to put a period right there. I could do all things, right? Yeah. I, could I, I could change my destiny. I could change it all. I can, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when I, when I don't put the period at the end of, I can do all things. And I, and I know that it's through Christ where a greater source of strength is found. Then I know whether I have a lot, whether I have a little, right? Then I can live a story that tells the world, hey, there, there is contentment that you can find. Um, and I don't know. I think that's that's got to be the best example that, and the best way we can tell somebody who denies that God is the author of their story. That also reminds me of, of the verse. I forget where it is. But I think it's Paul that says, uh, this is what I've learned. Therefore, whatever state that I am in, therewith to be content or something like that. Doesn't matter whatever is going on in my life, good, bad, or ugly. If I've got God on my side in the first place, then I should be content. Like this, this journey of life, there are moments of uncontentment for sure. But for the most part, I want to be content yeah. because without it, it's just miserable. <laughs> Life's just not as good, if that makes yeah. sense. It, it, it makes sense 100%. And, the, and contentment can be, um, contentment is, uh, it's tough to rest in. I, I mean, these last couple of years too, like, I mean, I, I'm I'm a pretty restless guy. Like, I I mean, I talk a good game when it comes to like finding contentment in Christ, but like, I have I'm, I have a I'm driven, like, and I think a lot of that's like how I was made too. Like, 
I'm a high achiever. You know what I mean? And I, Mm -hmm. I dream big dreams and I go after them. And while I, while I'm, you know, I really feel like God is pleased with me when, when he sees his creation doing what they were called to do, no matter how I'm wired, I'm also called to be still and know that he is God. Another translation says, cease striving. That's Psalm 4610. And so I'm wired to strive, but I've got to be still and cease striving and be reminded that he's God. And when I'm reminded that he's God, I'm reminded what else? I'm not. I'm reminded that because he's God, he's in control. And guess what else? I'm not. I'm reminded that he's God. And because I know he's God, I know that he is always with me because he says he is. Right. And so there was a lot of that that I was working through, even as I was writing The God Who Stays, rediscovering as somebody who's been a follower of God for a long time, going back to the basics of my faith, looking over the course of my story and seeing that never for a moment have I been alone. So your new book, The God Who Stays, you were talking a little bit about why you decided to write it in the first place, but a book like this wouldn't have been easy to write. How long did it take you to write? And what were some of the challenges that you faced in writing it? So I wrote it um, in pieces throughout 2020 and uh, the beginning of 20, well, really 2020 and 2021. Um, The chapter one was actually the first story that laid the foundation for the book, and that was in um, March of 2020, March 12th of 2020. And sometimes people can start talking about March of 2020 and people <laughs> can, uh, we still have some PTSD of just uh, yeah, kind of break out in a cold sweat. Remembering, you know, those were the, the early days when panic was, you know, just setting, beginning to to spike and Things were beginning to shut down. And and that was the day when the world shut down for me as a musician. Um, We were on tour in Trenton, New Jersey. They canceled the concert two hours before the show. The city of uh, Trenton was going on lockdown. Those were phrases we were not yet fully familiar with. Uh, Everybody was panicking, trying to get home to family, making sure your your wife and kids aren't sick, all these different things. And um, I don't want to get into the whole story, but um, I wound up booking a flight home that night and having to get to an airport an hour away from the arena, which led to me booking a very expensive Uber ride <laughs> to the airport. And it was my interaction with that Uber driver that laid the foundation for this book. On the day that the world was shutting down, I was having a panic attack in the back seat of an Uber car down the Jersey Turnpike. And, uh, a song came on the radio and it was my song. Huh. The God who stays was playing on the radio. And gosh, I had, I felt all alone in the backseat of that Uber. And then that song came on and I thought, well, isn't this something, you know, but that wasn't it. That wasn't the only thing that was taking place. I noticed the Uber driver was singing every word. He knew yeah. my song. And he was singing my song back to me and he was from a third world country. And so he, it sounded like it was in broken English. He was singing my song in broken English. And, uh, and so I, I started singing with him, maybe kind of tipping off that the singer of the song was in his Uber and I thought he would recognize me. But when I asked him how he thought I sounded, he said, Oh, not so good. And he kind of made fun of me. And he never put two and two together that I was the singer. Did you tell him his, your name? No, I never told him because he said I wasn't very good. And that was the funniest part is I was like, I was like, you don't think I sounded good? He's like, no. I said, well, why not? He's like, well, it, it's not your fault. You're not professional like the guy on the radio. <laughs> I'm like, uh, it is the guy on the radio. But we wound up having this great conversation the rest of the way to the airport. And I just kind of inquired. I was like, why do you like that song? You know, what, what, what's, why is that song special to you? And he told me his story of having to be forced to move from one country to the next, trying to become a citizen, trying to, you know, find where his next meal is going to come from, trying to get a job, being separated from family and loved ones. And he said, I like that song because it reminds me that he's been with me every step of the way. And I just, 
I can't describe to you the feeling and what happened in the months after that in our world and how God used that moment in an Uber with Arthur, the Uber driver, to like speak to me in a moment when I needed to be reminded that I was about to go through a hard time like everybody else, but I wasn't going to go through it alone. And uh, so that was the foundation of the book, March 12th of 2020. When I got home in the weeks that followed, I started writing that story down. And I, I just felt like I've got some more to say on this subject. A lot of times my songs, I'll get to the end of a three minute song that I've written and writing a song has to be, you got to tell your story in a compact way and make it rhyme and put it to a catchy melody that people might want to sing along with. Sometimes I get to the end of that song and I feel like I've got some more to say about that song. I want to unpack it. And The God Who Stays turned out to be a song that I thought I knew what it was about when I wrote it. But when 2020 and 2021 hit and that song was on the radio, I started to realize on a deeper level that I was going to gain even greater understanding of my own song after having lived through what we all went through. And that's really how the book was born. Wow. I love how books or just some creative ideas can be born through least expected moments. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Well, we got to live our lives. You know what I mean? I think the interactions we have with people, yeah. you know, as a creator, and you know this, I mean, with the book that you've written, it's like, as a songwriter, same thing. Like, we've got to live and experience life. And the story is going on all around us. Are we going to step into the story or not? You know, uh, are we going to become a character in somebody else's story? Or are we going to just focus on our own? And so, you know, that's one one of the reasons I love writing books is because I'm living life. And so the stories that I get to share in this book, whether it's uh, the story of me opening for uh, a heavy metal band in a biker bar back when I was in college, or the story of me jumping in open water to swim with sharks and being scared to death that I was going to, you know, get my knee eaten by a bull shark or the story of me jumping out of a plane or the story of me meeting an Uber driver. Like the story is, the story is happening all around us. And God is inviting us to step into that story, to take his hand and to walk with him. And uh, I just have found in my life that our stories and our lives, they look a whole lot different when we step into the story, when we take his hand and follow his lead through the story and realize that he's with us every step of the way. That's when that's when the stories of our lives get good. Yeah. I've got a couple more questions for you, my friend. Uh, what do you love the most about yourself and your story? Boy, I I struggle to say to like if that's a really hard question for me to answer when I think about like loving myself. Um, I'm my harshest critic. Yeah. I played the other night, I played a concert at the famous Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. And I was dreaming of this moment. We did this concert. It was this awesome time. But the minute I walked off stage, I was falling into this trap of just critiquing my performance. You know what I mean? And so I really struggle with that. And, um, and so one of the things and not to keep pointing back to the book but one of the things i wrote about that hits home for me in a big way is this thought that like we always focus on how god loves you but try this on for size he likes you too yeah do you know what i mean like i don't i don't know why that one seems like a harder one to grasp you know what i mean because sometimes like i don't like who i see when i look in the mirror or i don't like how i did that concert or i'll get done with this interview and be like man you idiot. Why did you answer that question that way or whatever? Like just self critiquing. And I'm like, why am I doing that to myself when the God I read about, he's not critiquing me. Mm. He's not, he's not critical of me. He's, he's loving and patient and kind. And he leads me beside still waters. And he, you know what I mean? And there's just uh, I think I rob myself of so much peace too often in my life because I fail to embrace how God really sees me and let that impact how I begin to see myself. God doesn't just love you. He likes you. That's, that's, I mean, right. I mean, I'll tell you what, if there's one reason you pick up the book, that might be the reason because that, that 
spoke to me so much and it still does. I tell you what, I've said that to an audience a few times at my concerts and I could hear this collective gasp (laughs) as if I said something outlandish, but it was almost as if they were breathing that in because it was oxygen. Like they needed that reminder too. And there it is. We're all living different stories, but we all need the same God. We all need that same reminder that we are loved, that we are liked, that we are known, that we are accompanied on our journeys, and that we're not alone. Yeah, we all have different stories, but one author. That's the truth. Yeah. My friend, where can people, where do you want them to get a copy of your book before I ask you the final question? Well, at thegodwhostays.com, it's kind of the official page for the book. And one of the things we always want to do, I do this when I release a song too, is never just a thing. It's things around the thing to help you go deeper to the main thing. (laughs) (laughs) I've never said it like that before. But so one of the things we're doing is like when people order the book, they can go to thegodwhostays.com. They can sign up and they're going to immediately, when the book released, uh, after the book releases, they get um, a video, a le- chapter by chapter video tour guide where I kind of walk you through like this is the heart behind this chapter. Um, you're going to get an exclusive interview. There's a lot of cool things there at thegodwhostays.com that specifically are related to the book itself. Free gifts. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> it comes out September 6th, I believe, in in the in the States. So I'll make sure everyone knows where to get a copy of the book, my friend. This is going to be my fourth, 400th episode that I'm wow. going to drop for people. So there's another amazing uh, wow, I'm honored. surprise for you. So 400 episodes of the Storybox is with Matthew West. And I wouldn't have had any other guests, my friend. Like mm. the, I was waiting for it. And here it is. <laughs> what an honor. What an honor it is. Thank you so much. And you're going to come on my podcast. You promise? I promise, my friend. I really do. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to our next conversation. My final question for you, my friend. This is my all-time favorite question. I love asking all my guests at the very end. It is a hypothetical one. You did mention legacy before. I'm like, hang on, just wait. We'll get to the end. But uh, I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Oh, what a great question. That That's why you have this show, man. <laughs> like that. Um <clears throat> Here's here's one of the things that I heard be I was I was on stage at a funeral. I had been asked to sing at a funeral for somebody I did not know who had passed away. And they were getting after they passed at this memorial service the very thing you just said in a roundabout way was happening because they opened it up for people to come up and share anything they wanted to share about him. So you had friends, family members, coworkers took turns. And I stood up on stage just singing and playing guitar in the background, not knowing this man, but learning who he was as a result of their testimony about him. But at the very end, his best friend stood up And closed out the memorial service. And he said, after hearing everybody speak today, I feel the most um, important legacy that we're leaving with about our friend is that of everybody who spoke, there was not one conflicting report. Hmm. And then he closed out the, the memorial service. I thought, whoa. Like not one conflicting report, right? It was, it was not, you know, uh, like the years ago, there was a, a miner who got trapped beneath the ground. And when they rescued him and brought him back to the earth, his wife was there and his girlfriend showed up. 
And that's when they found out that he had been living two lives, right? That's a drastic <laughs> example of the opposite of conflict. You know, there, there were some conflicting reports there, right? And I, I don't know. I think that's what comes to mind when I hear you ask that question that I want to get to the end and hopefully it'll it'll be widely known that I was far from perfect but also widely known that I turned my eyes and surrendered my life to a perfect love. And that at the end of the day, there were no conflicting reports about who I was on stage versus who I was off. The beautiful send off message for people to go away with and think about my friends go and get the God who stays life looks different with him by our side. It's available September 6th. So by the time this drops, It'll already be out, but thank you so much, Matthew West, man, for thank your you. wisdom, your advice, your story, just being you, and for an incredible conversation. I've uh, had a blast me today on the Storybox podcast. Well, thank you, and I look forward to hosting you on the Matthew West podcast, my friend. <laughs>